is there are two well-established types. One is with manic episodes and the other is with hypomanic episodes. There's some controversy about whether this is on a spectrum or whether these are distinct, but the, the, the thing to understand is that type two is not less severe than type one. In fact, people who have type two have a greater burden of depression, but the lifetime prevalence is about a little over 2%. So in the United States, that's more than 7 million people. With bipolar one, there's not a lot of time spent in mania, even though it can be devastating, but it's about a third of the time that people can have either major depressive episodes or depressive symptoms. I mentioned earlier with bipolar two, it's not less severe, it's just the hypomania is not as severe as the mania, but depression can be half the time that that people have so it's really a great great burden for people and it is relatively difficult to treat in some ways the response rates for antipsychotics as i mentioned before they're repurposed for lithium for the anticonvulsants that are repurposed and even for all the drugs it hovers around 50 percent that means for anybody, the probability of responding to any one of these drugs is about 50%, which is not that bad. If somebody doesn't respond to one, what's the probability that they'll respond to another? We don't quite know that. Although I'll tell you about a study that we're doing trying to answer that question for bipolar depression. And What's really important about the psychotherapies is that when they're mixed with medicine, when they're adjunct to medication, they can make a world of difference. And these are just some of the evidence-based psychotherapies that really can help. Out of all of these, the, the one that I'm really fond of is the last one, uh, which I like to call listen to your mother. And what that actually means is get a good night's sleep, eat real foods, eat good nutrition, don't smoke, don't take drugs, go outside and be with your friends and, and socialize. Uh, and, and also the other thing that's really important that our group is starting to study is brush your teeth. Because it turns out that gum disease is not good for your brain. And it's really important to take good care of your teeth. If it's the only thing you remember from, from this presentation, it's take good care of your teeth. Uh, so so um, again, but, but these interventions are, all of them, including the lifestyle intervention, is what you do between visits in addition to taking medication that can really help. One of the things that's happened over the year, years is that the past 20 years or so is that people are prescribing more antipsychotics and less mood stabilizers. And I just want to show you one thing as an example, which is the proportion of people who are taking lithium. Lithium is in green here. And between 97 and 98, about 30% of people were taking lithium. What's happened over the past 20 years is that's gone down to 15%, replaced by the second generation antipsychotics mostly. Many people who have psychiatric disorders, including bipolar disorder, just don't have their medical care integrated with psychiatric care. And I think we have to do a much better job of having collaborative care and again, I will tell you about a potential path to make that happen. My hope is that in two, three, four, five years, we're able to expand so we can help more people. So that's where the hope lies to have constant learning and constant improving, improvement in a learning health network. We would work together, we would collaborate, review cases together, be able to um, help each other consult to each other, solve the problems in collaboration with patients and their families.
to pre-visit planning, to measurement-based care, and see what's happening overall. This is a map that we were able to come up with, with what the current system of care is, where it's understanding and preventing, identifying, healing, treating, recovering, and sustaining the treatment. I don't want to go into the details of this, but we were trying to look at the entire system as a system of care. And in the Learning Health Network, we're trying to change that system in order to get better outcomes. That there is a very good journal from the International Society of Bipolar Disorder, and the name of the journal is the Journal of Bipolar Disorders. And that's because it can be a final common pathway of many things. Uh, the genetics, as I showed you just briefly, are you know, highly complex. Um, but certainly uh, brain trauma can also dysregulate the way the brain is working. And people can have a, a bipolar syndrome after brain trauma. You'd probably still treat it the same way. Um, but um, again, the, the, the point is that there are many paths that can lead to the disorder, including physical trauma to the head. So this, this happens in all of medicine, by the way that uh, uh, people will take medication or treatment, and then if they're feeling okay, they'll kind of stop it. People even do that for 10 days of antibiotics. The proportion of people who actually finish and take every pill for a 10-day course is, is rather low. So it's really no different than any sort of uh, long-term treatment where um, people feel like, well, you know, I'm doing okay. And I like to think of it as it's like an elephant repellent. If you have an elephant repellent in your house and there are no elephants, well, you don't know if the elephant repellent is working or if there are no elephants. And so what happens is that people will self-regulate and they'll test it and they'll go, you know, I've been doing okay for two years. I'm not sure I need this anymore. I'm not sure it's worth the side effects anymore. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll just stop it and see. Uh, and then what happens is that for many people with bipolar disorder, it usually comes back. So in many ways, it comes down to someone's experience. And I've seen people where they needed to have six relapses until they said, you know, I don't like this happening anymore. And maybe I'd like to reduce the probability that it's going to happen again. Maybe the way to do that is to really take the medication. Um, so it has to meet their own goals. Right. And, and I think there's a blend of giving the information. Um, there's also, you know, NAMI is a great source of information. There's also the International Bipolar Foundation that has really terrific information for people. Um, and I think educating people about it, uh, that look, you know, here's the probability if you don't take the meds, and would you like to make that probability half of that by taking the meds? You know, what's your ultimate goal? What do you want to happen? And in many ways, what, what I think is most important is to ask people what's, what, what, what's matter, what's, what matters to them, right? What is it that they want? What are their goals? And how could they achieve that? And what's gonna increase the probability that good things will happen and decrease the probability that bad things will happen, right? And then they could decide what they ultimately wanna do. So, so again, this is the controversy of, of like, do you give somebody an, an antidepressant or not? Um, the other thing is that, you know, again, this is why bipolar two is, is still more mysterious than it should be. Um, and, and this is the other problem, that exact combination, right? A boost bar, effects or lamictal has never been studied. 
And many people will end up taking combinations that, you know, we, we don't know if it helps or not, but the, the clinician will try to do things that are empirical. And this is why I'm so excited about the Learning Health Network, because we can look at that. Right? We'll have thousands of people, you know, treated with thousands of things. We could try to figure out, well, is somebody doing well? Are they not doing well? Does that combination work? Does it not work? And ultimately, what we'd like to have is that, okay, somebody comes in and we could show 5,000 people just like that person, their treatments and their outcomes, and then have it so that we know, oh, this is probably going to work better than something else. Um, so, so, you know, Lamictal and Bipolar 2, understudied. Um, there's one study of Effexor for Bipolar 2 depression that's in the literature from a guy named Jay Amsterdam. Nobody's replicated it. We don't know. Boosbar or Boosbarone, um, again, it's an interesting anti-anxiety agent that's not like Valium or, or Ativan or that sort of thing. Maybe that's helping. What the combination does, I don't know. <laughs> but if it's helping, that's fine. I don't care. I think that goes back to what matters to the person. And are they, are, are they living the life that they want to live? Um, or are things getting in the way? And if things are getting in the way, what are the potential things that can help? Uh, now, you know, it's, it's sort of very basic. You know, are, are you doing what you want to do? And are you happy with that? Um, and are you functioning the way you want to function? Uh, you know, are you living what you would consider to be a good life? Um, so, so some of that is under a paradigm called motivational interviewing that is frequently used for people who have substance use disorders, right? It's like, what's your goal? Are, is, is, is your substance use helping or not? You know, uh, is, it, is it hurting? Is it helping? What are you getting out of it? And, and it's the same sort of thing with insight, right? And if you reflect back to somebody, this is what I've observed and I'm concerned, right? And, and also bring it back to what they want eventually people do come around right and they do start to realize ah you know this is not good i don't i don't want to do this anymore right i, I don't want to go back to the hospital if i don't have to um okay so you know maybe you should get engaged in some treatment that you find helpful i think it depends and what i mean by that is that you know i have people who are fine i mean they're really i tell them look come in every six months so you don't forget who i am I want to see you every six months and they come in every six months and they're fine, you know, and they're taking the meds, they're, they're, they're living their lives, they're doing okay. They don't particularly need psychotherapy. There are other people where uh, they have dysregulations, problems with navigating through life, uh, relationships, other things that, that um, make it so that therapy can really help a lot. And in many ways, I see therapy as having two important functions. One is decreasing stress. It may not surprise you. Stress is not really good for you. And things that decrease your stress, that's good for you. The other thing that psychotherapy can provide are tools to manage stress also someone's own internal dialogue that sometimes is helpful and sometimes is not uh, and help people navigate through the world. Um, so if people need those things, uh, then it's very helpful. For other people, group therapy can help. So they start to have, a, have more insight of how they relate to other people. Um, so really, I think matching the right therapy to the right person at the right time is what's essential. The fancy word for co-occurring is comorbid. And um, the earlier that somebody has the onset of their bipolar disorder, the more likely they have comorbid ADHD. And in fact, sometimes what happens is ADHD comes first um, when they're young. 
For the very young people who have bipolar disorder, and that's a whole nother controversy, but if they have it either prepubital or in early adolescence, the proportion who have comorbid ADHD is very high. That presents a particular problem because the treatments for ADHD can destabilize people who have bipolar disorder if you don't give it correctly. And the trick with treating comorbid ADHD is to start on stimulants, stimulants very low and go up very slowly and watch carefully for any sort of dysregulation. But it also can be life changing for the better when people are able to regulate their attention. I, I like to point out that ADHD is not a deficit of attention. It's a dysregulation of attention. That's why you'll see people who have ADHD can concentrate and spend six hours on video games because it's rewarding and they can hyper focus on that, but they can't get off of it, right? It's dysregulated. They also can't regulate their attention and pay sufficient attention to those things that are boring or routine, right? And then, then they're disorganized. They can't get that sort of things done. But the, um, the treatments for ADHD are extraordinarily useful. You just have to be very careful. Uh, so I actually don't know enough about it to give you an intelligent answer. Um, uh, there, there are some studies of just ADHD and neurofeedback that turn out to be positive. Um, but I don't know about the use of neurofeedback in the context of people who also have bipolar disorder. Um, but as I said before, if it helps somebody experience less stress, I'm all for it. <laughs>